Hi, everyone. I'm Michel Bayan, CEO and co-founder of Direct Tech Labs. Many of you work with us to discover the deeper truths of what's really going on with your customers and sales representatives and to automate new retention and new revenue. And deeper truths is what this video series is all about. Today's topic is all about reputation. And so we'll be talking to three of the top executives in the industry about their ideas and philosophies and practices within their companies of what they're doing to play their part in turning our industry's reputation around. I hope you'll find some inspiring content here. And of course, you're welcome to continue the conversation on our LinkedIn group, the Direct Selling Leadership Forum, linked below. Today's guests are Lori Bush, co-founder of Solvasa, Clint McKinley, CEO of Ruby Ribbon, and Gordon Hester, Chief Innovation Officer at Zervita. I hope you'll enjoy our conversation and stay tuned for more videos in the weeks and months to come. Although for Silvasa, focusing on compassionate marketing and standing down a bit on promoting the opportunity through March and through April may feel like a missed opportunity, the recent delivery of letters from the FTC to 10 direct selling companies about product and earnings claims associated with the COVID pandemic has validated that our decision has been a good one. But whether there's a pandemic or not, all companies in our channel need to learn about the red flag hashtags that our Salesforce representatives are often tempted to use, especially the one that makes my skin crawl, which is the hashtag financial freedom. So um, as an industry, you know, and as individual companies, um, our reputation is already, you know, less than stellar. And, and, and some groups are criticizing the practices that certain companies are doing in the field. We've had that warning letters go out from the FTC, other articles. What are the key pitfalls that companies really need to avoid? And, and, and how do we emerge from this crisis with a better reputation than the one we came in with? I think a key pitfall that companies make is taking the focus off of the experience of the end user, of the customer. And once the focus is on having very happy customers, and we begin with that, then you build businesses with field leadership that are lasting, that are built upon the exchange of value, which are the cornerstones of any real business. And the more the focus is on that, and having happy customers, what we have learned is that customers will react how they will react. And we can actually pull their behavior in with different offers and different price elasticity. How the field responds to that is very telling. And the members in the field who, who we work closely with, who, who we talk transparently with them about the business, they all understand that these things work together very closely. And that when we think about the end user, we think about that woman who's putting on a cami and her experience, that's what matters most because we don't have any of the other stuff without that. And if we are hyper-focused on making that happen, all of the reputation of the industry seems to kind of fall away. You know, we're, we're focusing on something pure and something good. A few other things I would say is have transparency directly between the C-suite and the top leadership in the company. For CEOs, regular interaction in the C-suite with the very top leaders, talking through decisions, listening to some things that they may that they may say that maybe you don't want to hear pay them the respect of listening to them and they will respect you much more as a leader when you disagree because you took the time to hear them out and to be transparent and i think if they feel like the company is being transparent with them they are much more on board with the overall program and if the overall program is customer value is paramount it all kind of works together in a good cycle. So we have a responsibility as an executive to create a feedback loop that is honest and transparent with them and to keep the focus on the customer. I think it's also very important for companies to know their ratios, to know what the percentage is from customers to uh, stylists or consultants or representatives that they have in the field and to make sure they have an overwhelming majority of, of the money coming into the company to be coming in from happy customers. And if that's the case, all these criticisms seem to fall by the wayside. I love what you're saying. And I think there's still a common thread with all three of the points that you're saying, which is it's really about this value to value exchange. This concept that if you, if we can trust this idea that if we give them value, they will give us value in return. 
the ROI of that exchange is so much greater than the alternative. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what we still see so much of in the space is, is what I call the one ring to rule them all strategy, which is this idea that uh, companies are still thinking, what is the one experience that I can push to everyone that maximizes um, people getting to the top of my comp plan? And that the value proposition is, how many people do I get to the top of my comp plan? Not how many customers love me and, and, and praise me to the, to the social media world. Or you, can still, you can still have programs that are fun, you know, but, but at sure. the end of the day, none of that works. None of that comp plan at the top stuff works unless it's built upon a house on a solid foundation. Otherwise, you may as well build a house on a hurricane alley with no foundation on the beach. It's going to crumble. Uh, there has to be something strong there to, to build on. And if everybody was at the top of the comp plan, it wouldn't make sense. I mean, the fact of the matter is not everybody can be there. And not everybody is above average. In fact, only 50% is above average. I mean, everybody wants to think we should all be there, but I don't think that's numerically possible. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and when you look at the data, I mean, we've been fortunate enough because we, we now have a database of 20 million direct sellers in 70 countries and every single purchase, commission, uh, recruit, everything they've ever done over a six and a half year period. And when we look at the patterns of behavior of all these 20 million people, we find that, you know, there's actually a really small percentage of people who seem to even want to, to get the work. to the top of the comp plan. That like the value proposition for them is in many cases, not even really seeming to be primarily about the money. There's some other value that they're getting primarily out of being part of a community during an epidemic of loneliness, mm-hmm. right? About getting behind a social mission that they can believe in and about being the center of a product or service in their local community and the, and the status that comes from being able to be that person, that maven in their community. And the money's good too. Yeah, this and, is and, the community is big. Yeah, and, and, and when we look at the data and we see like for most companies, actually those people are the ones that actually drive more revenue as a group than any other group. And yet when most companies communicate to them, it's always about, well, hey, you're really not good enough. You should really be there. You know? Well, that's my bread and butter. Yeah, redefining. And, I think this is the new generation has a different es- es- essence of what money is. I'm a Gen Xer, right? So I care about things like income and status. They like they make me feel special that I'm a diamond on Delta Airlines. And don't you take that from me. And <laughs> that, 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 you know, I work hard for that shit, right? Uh, but, you know, I, I think in this, in this generation now, I I think they want experiences more than money. And that's one thing I learned from Lori is if you can give them great experiences, experiences that they would never have somewhere else, maybe they could afford them, but they just wouldn't do them because it's would be too much planning and too much work and, or, or even like more than you'd want to spend, even if you could afford it, give them those kind of experiences. They, that will cement them to the brand early. And I'm not just talking about Bora Bora type of things. I mean, the way that, yeah. how they unbox things delighting the brand experience throughout. And I'm not claiming to be on here as an expert for me, other than to say the industry needs to get better at this. Um, One thing that we learned when we launched over in Thailand uh, with a, with with a prior company overseas was that the unboxing videos that we had our influencers do on Instagram were crazy. Uh, They were so fun. Uh, They got a ton of virality and it was now unboxing is a total thing, right? At the time it was kind of a little newer, but just delighting them with, I wanted a box as cool as the Apple watch. And, and that's what we gave our team as the, as the standard. And they came out with the most beautiful <laughs> white box that was magnetic and looked amazing and like right away delighting. And then anybody else who wants to talk about building a business and a comp plan, if that's your base, if that's your foundation of delightful pe- people who are delighted when the package shows up, that's how we overcome the yuck of everything. And so a lot of that and a lot of the practices that you're talking about are going to lead to some type of effect on the overall reputation of the space. What are the key pitfalls for us to avoid? And, and how do we emerge from this crisis with a better reputation than the one we came in with? Well, I think first you have to accept that we don't have a good reputation. You, you can cherry pick stories, you can see all the good, but it doesn't ignore that we have a reputation and a perception problem. And it is not a new problem. I can remember years ago going to a DSA um, conference when Neil Often was running it. And he got on stage and he was just so irritated and so frustrated. Why can nobody see the good 
in this and why, why do we have all these critics? But the interesting part of it was he, he said back in the 70s, we actually commissioned a company to look at reputation and to give us some advice. And basically their advice was, don't bother, you're too far in the hole. And I'm like, and that's horrible advice Yikes. because the reality is reputation matters. Um, and if you follow like the Reputation Institute that sort of studies this, you see how much it matters to growth, to opportunity, to stability and longevity. It's kind of a simple rule to me is if you lose trust in the marketplace, you're going to struggle to have a future. So at the core of this, I think what our industry does really well also hurts our industry. And that is we market hope. And um, I kind of always think about engagement. So building relationships is a simple behavioral formula that um, engagement equals the triumph of hope over experience. So you got two simple variables there, hope and experience. And if I were to ask a lot of network marketers, which one is more important, I know what the answer would be. Well, it's hope. But so where does hope come from? Hope is just our belief system about the future. It comes from experiences. So the mastery of business isn't the mastery of marketing hope. It is the mastery of experiences. And a good experience is positive, meaningful, creates hope. This is the big one, confirms hope. Hope's a beggar. You have to have experiences to confirm it or it goes away, it shifts that changes the mindset of how beliefs work. And then the fifth one is to magnify hope so that even when you have a bad experience, people still stay engaged. And what's the magnification? Faith. You know, when you have faith in something, it can't be defeated by experiences. So I look at the reputation issue as the only place we need to look is in the mirror. And we have to accept that we have done a wonderful job marketing hope but we're not necessarily setting up good expectations with doing it and how it's done. And because that has been practiced a little bit more than it should, all the good gets lost, all the great stories, all the transformation. And, and we deal with this reputation issue. So how do you solve it? Accept it and focus on the problem. Stop marketing hope that we don't deliver on. So I just use the, the most classic example to me is the income part. Why am I out there telling these multi-million dollar stories when the average person on their best day is going to make meaningful part-time income? Now, the people that have these big stories would tell you, well, this is, we want people to believe, we want people to dream, we want them to see what's possible. But if four out of 100,000 people can do it, is it possible? Is it, or, or are we playing the wrong game? Are we setting up people for failure because we're setting up expectations that are not necessary and also not paying attention. Most people can't even comprehend those numbers. And most those people, comp plans. those comp plans. Yeah. And, and what's interesting is sometimes I think our industry forgets that three or $400 a month is a game changer for the average person, a complete game changer. If you think I'm wrong, go pay attention to what's going on in the gig world. That's exactly what that world is built on. Can there, that's, the there average, higher, that's the average monthly income of a gigger is about $300. Yeah, and, and it's interestingly enough, it's kind of, so Jensen, the comp plan group, they studied this with all the data they had, and they came up with this current term called golden handcuffs. And it was really, how much money do you have to make for people to stay engaged in network marketing? And in the US, it was three to 500 bucks. So it all kind of fits together. And part of the concern on the evolution is there's a lot of argument that the gig world is ahead of us, especially on the technology and data and the architect of the business model. And that's where we're losing people. And this is the yeah. lifeblood. I don't care what company you go into, you'll probably find greater than 80% of all sales acquisition and recruiting come from your part-timers. If they're not here, you can't establish stability and you'll never create leadership. There's also various studies that have been done, including by the Direct Selling Education Foundation, that actually said it's the intangible things that people are addicted to. Better time management, getting confidence in themselves, um, soft skills, like how to properly communicate and, and work with people. And what's interesting about it and this is kind of the personal development, but I think there needs to be a business and financial development piece too for it all to work together, but that's for another discussion. But, but if you look at it, not only do these skills matter, but they translate immediately into people's lives. 
So if I'm, if I get better at time management, I put that into my job. I put that into my family. I put that into my life. If I get stronger at communication, I have an immediate impact to that. And, and unfortunately, this is the thing that we don't talk about that actually matters the most. Even the DSA, when they did studies, they found out the number one reason why people get into this industry is for fun. It, it, we never really even talk about these things, but they're important. And companies that know how to build understand the behavioral part of this. It's just not business. It's just not about money. It's just not about selling products. Actually, it's quite the opposite. It's the behavior that drives all that. And that's the piece you have to get right. And I think that's kind of, that was my differentiation when I came out of school. I became a behavioralist because I was smart enough or I listened to somebody that said, hey, business is just about solving problems and people. And most problems are people. So you better understand how they work and operate. And that's where I spent most of my career. Thank you to all the executives for their contributions and thoughts. And stay tuned. We're going to be continuing this series of videos with more executives and more topics in the weeks and months to come. And of course, we will be continuing this discussion on our LinkedIn group, the Direct Selling Leadership Forum. Look for a link below this video. As it relates to our reputation, I think the moral of the story is that reputation comes down to the quality of experience people have during their life cycle with you. And if we all were to just take a look at the way higher than average or normal churn rates that most direct selling companies have, we would just see in the pure math that the quality of experience that people are getting these days just isn't really good enough. We can do so much better. And it isn't just for its own sake. It isn't just to prove to regulators that we're not bad guys. It's actually to build a better business because business efficiency is a big problem that we have in our space. And so thinking about the quality of experience our people have uh, increases their lifetime value, which increases the value they get from and give to your business, lengthens their lifespan. And then when one day when they eventually do leave, brings good brand equity because they have something good to say about their experience with your brand. And so thank you very much as always for listening. Looking forward to continuing the conversation on the LinkedIn group, the Direct Selling Leadership Forum. Click below and you can request to join and we'll see you there.